Welcome everyone and thank you for joining the Kootenai Conservation Program's Winter Webinar Series. This year our webinar series focuses on the theme of biodiversity in the Kootenays. My name is Marcy Marr and I'm KCP Stewardship Coordinator and I will be your host today for the webinar. Uh, Nicole Trigg, KCP's Communications Coordinator, is also on board to ensure that our technology runs smoothly today. And I would like to acknowledge that KCP's work occurs in the traditional territories of the Tunaha, Shushwap, Sinaiks, and Silks people who have lived in this region and stewarded the land for many generations. While some people are still joining us, I'd like to talk a bit about the Kootenai Conservation Program, known as KCP. We're a broad partnership founded in 2002 and currently comprised of more than 80 land and water conservation and stewardship groups, government agencies, resource industries, and agricultural producers working throughout the East and West Kootenays in Southeastern BC. KCP's mandate is to coordinate and facilitate conservation efforts on private land and generate the support and resources needed to maintain this effort. And we achieve this by increasing the effectiveness, collaboration, and coordination of private land securement and stewardship activities, building financial and technical capacity for our partner organizations, and serving as a network to achieve efficiencies, synergies, and ultimately greater effectiveness. We're always interested to know who's joined us. So please respond to these two questions uh, in your chat box and uh, it'll be at the bottom of your screen and tell us um, where are you based and what is your affiliation? So again, if you're just joining us, um, we're interested in, um, in knowing who you are and where you're from. So if, if you could tell us where are you based and your affiliation, please, and type that into the chat box. We have about 50 people on the webinar uh, with us so far. Okay, and while people are filling this in, um, I'm going to tell you a bit about um, the webinar today. So it'll be approximately 40 minutes with up to 15 minutes uh, for questions at the end. Um, you as an audience member are on mute and you will be for the duration of the presentation. So we don't have distracting background noises and feedback. And if you're not familiar with the Zoom platform, take a moment to locate your control panel by hovering your mouse over the bottom of the screen. And that's where you'll find the chat box. And if you have any technical issues, um, please uh, type that into the chat box and uh, Nicole Trigg will be monitoring that um, and hopefully do her best to help you. And if you have questions about the presentation, uh, click uh, on the Q&A option and at the bottom toolbar and type in your question and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. And the webinar will be recorded and made available on our website. So tomorrow you'll be receiving a follow-up email with the presenter's contact information, a link to the webinar recording, uh, any resources uh, that we, we have to share with you, and also a short post-webinar survey. So we're hoping you'll take a couple minutes and complete that survey because it really helps us plan our next uh, winter webinar series. So we really also are appreciative at KCP of our sponsors and supporters and um, without whom we wouldn't have these types of capacity building webinars. So thanks to them. And today is our third webinar in our series. Uh, if you missed our other webinars, Getting to Know Breeds, and We Should Plant Meadows, you can find links to the recordings and resources on KCP's website. Uh, we will wrap up our series on March 12th with Corey Lawson of the Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada, and her talk will be Back to the Basics, Reevaluating Bat Boxes Based on Bat Needs. So join us for that one. And now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Clayton Lamb. Clayton is a wildlife biologist with a PhD from the University of Alberta and is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Universities of British Columbia in Montana. Clayton's work focuses on identifying the factors driving changes in wildlife populations, changes that both increase and decrease abundances. Uh, he's worked on a diverse uh, international projects that span the small climate change threatened American pika to interprovincial 
wolverine DNA analyses to grizzly bear population ecology across five mountain ranges. So I'd like to um, thank you and introduce um, Clayton for being a part of this, uh, for being a part of this uh, Kootenai uh, Conservation Program webinar series. So I'll turn it over to you, Clayton. Thanks a lot, Marcy. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, this is probably the first webinar that I've ever given. So I'm excited to present it to you folks and it feels a little different than a normal scientific conference. I'm sitting in my office by myself and it's a little, little lonely, but ex excited to hear from you folks questions and uh, yeah, to present this work to you. So this is basically um, kind of a summary of some research that I've been doing with a large team over the last five or six years. It was basically uh, my PhD thesis, which I completed at um, the University of across productivity and human influence gradients. So just before we get going here, I just want to acknowledge the dozens of dedicated field staff that helped me collect all these data uh, for this work and also my academic and conservation mentors for teaching me how to conduct and apply this rigorous science to enact uh, meaningful conservation outcomes for wildlife and for people. So today we're going to talk about the carnivore coexistence conundrum. Um, carnivores range across the world uh, have shrunk drastically in the last century, largely due to human land use, eroding intact habitat, and you know, the resulting uh, increasing human carnivore conflict that comes from this overlap. Um, due to shifting societal views, these, the landscape is changing. We're seeing um, novel situations where some carnivores are actually rebounding near people. And so my research basically set out to ask the question, uh, how coexistence occur? And how can we leverage evidence to basically foster this coexistence? So I use grizzly bears as my focal species. Um, these animals are wide ranging, uh, they're conflict prone, and they pose serious threats to human safety. Uh, so as a result, they create an ideal species to investigate how uh, the population dynamics of a carnivore species coexist uh, across gradients of human influence. So this is basically a look at the current and historic range of grizzly bears. Um, it's shrunk by about half over the past 200 years. Uh, and much of that historic range now sort of looks like the bottom left. It's been converted to intense agriculture or cities. And when we think of, you know, what is now prime grizzly bear habitat, a lot of it looks like the top left. These are sort of wild intact landscapes um, with minimal human influence on them. So I focused on British Columbia, uh, which is the whole in Canada, and it's a place that it's experiencing the greatest human population growth in Canada, um, and set a crossroads for grizzly bears. Um, the basic question is, will populations continue to shrink under these increasing human populations and pressures, or are there surprising ways that bear populations may actually increase or persist across the province? And I think that, you know, we're seeing bear populations actually push into their former range, so it's a prime time to ask that question. So even though I said, you know, there's sort of this dichotomy between where bears aren't and then this wild landscape where they are, um, in between that complete wilderness and, you know, complete human influence are these coexistence landscapes. Um, these are areas where large portions of the southern grizzly bear range basically look like um, cities and towns and multiple use landscapes. They're nested uh, amongst active grizzly bear populations. So basically, I exploited this range of human influence on the landscape and leveraged it in my work to understand you know, that's the town of Fernie with some great bear habitat in the background, uh, southwest Alberta in the top right, and then, you know, the just sort of general human um, multi-use landscape that we see in BC in the bottom right, uh, logging roads and some resource uh, extraction and then people using the landscape. So this is just a quick video to sort of show you what a, um, what a landscape looks like for grizzly bears and their habitat selection uh, in a coexistence landscape. You'll see the animals uh, must navigate cities, uh, coal mines, two major highways, Highway 3 and 43, um, as well as lots of rural development. So uh, every dot is a grizzly bear relocation from um, telemetry data. And um, yeah, I'll just run it here now and you'll basically see uh, how they use the habitat in a relatively complex landscape. So they, they coal 
Just avoid the left areas, cross the highway quite a bit, and avoid sort of the centers of town. This is the town of Elkford we're coming over right now in Southeast British Columbia. So a relatively complex landscape for them to um, navigate, but also, I mean, there are still bears here and they are coexisting in novel ways. So that's what we're gonna look into today. So I used a variety of grizzly bear data to answer my questions. Um, much of these data were collected before I started on my work, but I also ran my own uh, grizzly bear uh, coloring program and conducted three years of hair sampling. Uh, and collectively, these data represent some of the largest grizzly bear uh, samples and the largest spatial coverage uh, of any carn carnivore demographic data set in the whole world. Um, so the hair sampling and the coloring were conducted in the, uh, the red polygons you see on the landscape all across BC. And these, uh, these cover also human influence ranging from um, basically complete wilderness all the way to uh, the center of cities. So we use collar data, which is you know, shown on the left, uh, a bunch of grizzly bear mortality data from the province, which is in the middle, and then hair snagging data, um, which you genotype with DNA in the, uh, in the top right there. So the basic structure um, will look like this. So kind of four main topics that we'll hit on. Um, the first is a paper on the effect of road density on a threatened grizzly bear population. Uh, the second will be uh, grizzly bear populations caught in an ecological trap. The third will be the mechanisms of carnivore coexistence across ecosystems. And then four, I'll kind of wrap this all up and say how we use that evidence to actually um, make some applied conservation outcomes for wildlife. So this is a look at grizzly bear density across the province. Um, darker uh, blue is basically higher density, lighter yellow, lower, and then the white hashed out areas are areas that there are no grizzly bears. So the first thing you can see is grizzly bear density varies quite a bit across the province. And so that's basically the, uh, um, something that we'll look at, basically what structures this change in grizzly bear density across BC. And we'll look at three main areas. So uh, a threatened population, um, uh, an area with high conflict, and then we'll look at the whole province. So we'll start here. Um, we'll focus on a low density threatened grizzly bear population on the range margin. So this is um, yeah, a paper in the Journal of Applied Ecology. It's called uh, The Effect of Road Density on a Threatened Grizzly Bear Population. So this is a look at the landscape, how it changed um, over a period of about 30 years. So this is uh, just the south end of Granby Provincial Park um, and it changed drastically. So it went from you know, a relatively wild intact landscape thing and um, resource extraction, uh, the landscape changed a lot. And it basically sparked some public outrage over the drastic habitat changes from logging and road building in the Granby Valley. So we were brought in to ask some questions. Um, what influence do roads have on bear density? And does access management help? And of those of you that are not familiar with access management, uh, that basically means uh, the road stays intact, but human, um, human use on the landscape is limited. So generally that means that the public is restricted from um, using motorized vehicles on the road surface, uh, but they can hike, they can ride their bike, they could take horses up there. And industry is allowed to go up there um, periodically when they do, uh, say, pull a clear cut out of there in the future. So we did a DNA market capture in this area. So um, basically, we set a bunch of barbed wire around the landscape, um, corralled in a whole pile of sticks and rotten wood, and then poured rotten cow blood all over it. So that's what you can see uh, our field technician, Laura, doing that. You can see her arm is fully extended uh, to make sure she's as far away from this rotten cow blood as she can. And basically this simulates uh, like a cached kill where a, a cougar or another bear would have cached say a dead elk or a dead cow under here and the bears go in to check it out and leave a little bit of hair on the barbed wire as they go under. So we set 124 sites of these across the landscape. And here's basically a look at the raw data. So uh, again, this is the Granby Valley and the Okanagan. Uh, you can see the Okanagan Lake on the left side there um, and uh, Castle Gar on the bottom right. So you can see immediately the, the red dots are where we caught bears. The yellow dots are where we had sites and did not. And then the red lines are sort of where we 
repeatedly one thing that pops out right away is the um, the parks, uh, which are the um, the green areas, they were definitely the strongholds for bears. So you can see that right away, these sort of more secure areas were highly selected for grizzly bear density. So we found that high road densities were associated with lower bear densities. Uh, I used a commonly discussed road density threshold from the literature, uh, which is about 0 0.6 kilometers of roads per square kilometer. But to date, this, the fit of this threshold sorry, the fit of this threshold um, had not really been tested very well uh, against bear density. It was mostly tested um, against uh, like habitat selection, but not against the number of bears in the landscape. So we tested it and yeah, for sure, there was fewer bears where there was higher road density exceeding this 0 0.6 threshold. So um, yeah, definitely showed a negative influence of road density on bears in the region. But, but I guess, the management actions was uh, did access management help so by restricting human access on landscape um, did it help at all so the access management that was applied in the area boosted those local bear populations by 27 percent so yeah a sign that doing access management can help bear populations so basically the take home from that was that roads had strong negative influences on bear density and that managing access can reduce road issues for grizzly bears. So the next one is about grizzly bears caught in an ecological trap. Um, this is in Southeast British Columbia, uh, sort of straddled on the BC Alberta border and the BC Montana border, basically centered on the town of Fernie. And this area is characterized by having relatively high bear densities, relatively rich uh, food, resources both in natural foods as well as all these other sorts of foods that don't exist elsewhere like roadkill, um, apple trees, garbage, things like that that only exist sort of amongst people. So the main question was does an ecological trap exist in southeast BC and you know you may be wondering what is an ecological trap so the basic idea is an ecological trap is an area where animals um, select habitat that they think they're going to do quite well in. they'll either survive very well in or reproduce well in and then they don't they uh, basically their fitness cues that they expect to do um, to provide benefits decouple from the expected outcome so you can kind of think about that as an actual trap like a uh, like a mouse trap for example uh, a mouse sees a a little piece of cheese and or peanut butter which works better um, and basically thinks of, you know, increasing calories and maybe having uh, more offspring and expects that choice to do, do well animal. And then of course that doesn't work out and it's killed. So that's kind of the idea that the, um, the expected outcome is not what the animals, um, or the realized outcome is not what the animals expect. So to ask this question, basically we had to uh, compare the coexistence, the sort of human dominated landscape against the wilderness areas. So we asked, um, is the habitat in the ecological trap more attractive than other places? Do animals survive poorer? And are animals immigrating in despite this lethality? So you can imagine if animals do really poor in amongst people, uh, their populations would just basically shrink to zero over long periods of time. But if animals also then immigrate to backfill those vacancies, then these sort of these dynamics then persist for long periods of time. So this is the focal region, uh, again, Southeast British Columbia. And we broke it up into three main zones. So a Northern area is sort of this well, um, area with no human. Uh, the middle area, which we call the trap, has Highway 3 and 43 in it, a number of towns, um, Elkford, Sparwood, Fernie, Cranbrook, and um, then the South, which is the Flathead. And again, sort of this wild contrast. And you can see the sources of mortality are the triangles and the crosses there. And you, you know, not surprisingly, all the non-hunters sort of conflict, or conflict mortality, whether it's um, highway kills or uh, conflicts over attractants are all structured in that sort of pink zone, the trap zone. So the first question was, is this area at least as attractive or more attractive than the wilderness? Like, is there a nutritional benefit for animals to be here? So we used two of the key, uh, main fruiting species that bears eat when they're putting on fall during the important hyperphagia period. So soapberry and huckleberry, 
And the, so the plot shows in the middle is the trap zone and then um, straddle on either side is the north south. And you see um, the per capita availability of those two important uh, fruit resources was higher in the trap zone. So we had an idea that there was attractive habitat and then the question was about survival. So given these animals are living down here amongst people, do they survive poorer? So yes, obviously um, they do survive poorer um, by quite a bit in that middle zone in the trap compared to the other two wilderness zones. And this is not necessarily that surprising. I mean, there's all these sort of novel ways that these animals can face mortality issues when they're living in amongst the sort of matrix of people. So on the right is just a, uh, that's a photo of a grizzly bear in the back of a conservation officer's truck. And there's two pigs actually behind it. So this bear broke into a farm, um, killed a bunch of pigs. And of course the bear was, uh, was legally shot in defense of life and property. So these sort of conflicts just don't exist in the backcountry. Those kind of problems don't survival would be lower. And then the final piece is, do animals actually then immigrate into this more risky zone to backfill? Um, those, uh, those vacancies that are created from the low survival? And the answer is yes. So this is basically projected over a, a decade, um, how many bears would uh, flow in and die versus um, get born in the middle trap zone and then leave and go to the back country. And it's about 10 to one. So 40 bears would come in for every four that go out. So good evidence that there is immigration coming into this, uh, this area. And, you know, we're, we're always pretty hard on, um, hard on evidence. And so we really wanted to make sure that this was happening. So we also grabbed a bunch of collar data and wanted to see if we could actually see individuals moving in and uh, see this dynamic happening in really fine scales. So uh, we have about five or six examples of where animals have done this. And I just highlight one here for you. This is in Montana, it's natal range. So uh, it's mama's collar, this bear was a known bear. And those are its mom and that bear's location in America in the bottom. And then it dispersed. We don't have that dispersal because um, it lost its color by then. Then we picked it up um, in BC and those are the, uh, the BC dots on the top. It lived around Cranbrook and Fort Steele for a while and it was eventually killed uh, in Fort Steele. So yeah, we're seeing that the, these sort of ecological trap dynamics have international pull and they're quite wide ranging. So it's about like 95 kilometers was this displacement. So the take home there was that uh, attractive habitat creates an appealing landscape for grizzly bears uh, that can be very risky for them. Um, the influence of mortality also extends well beyond those localized point sources and affect wilderness areas. So just because a bear is killed in town, it's not just necessarily a loss of that local bear. Um, the source dynamics that the trend of animals into those areas actually extends, you know, up to 100 kilometers from that localized area of conflict. So it, I feel like it, uh, it really gave us a different perspective on uh, the scale that which conflict acts across a larger landscape and how, and how localized conflict can actually you know, influence these more remote wilderness areas. So the final uh, sort of data piece is uh, the mechanisms of carnivore coexistence across ecosystems. So this is gonna be across all of British Columbia. And this work is not yet published, but it's, uh, it's in review right now. So we'll see. So this is at the BC scale. Basically, what's, what's the coexistence story for grizzly bears across the whole province? And the landscapes that bears are coexisting in uh, uh, right now are complex and also quite complex. These are just a, a handful of pictures I pulled off of um, and Elkford uh, wildlife sightings page. So um, all of these bears we actually had collared at some point and we know them and you know they do a lot of uh, living right amongst people. Um, the one in the middle is a bear looking into somebody's pool, um, walking downtown on pavement in the bottom right. So yeah, relatively complex uh, landscape for them to navigate, but they're there. So basically we wanted to know um, how are these coexistence <clears throat> landscapes uh, areas where people and carnivores co-occur and persist sustained across ecosystems. So what are the demographic mechanisms that basically uh, foster this? So yeah, you've seen this slide before, but 
basically we used all the data that we had. So this is kind of the, the crescendo of all the, of my PhD and everything that we could kind of muster to um, gather insight into. And just to kind of give you an idea, um, the, I guess the, um, what we use to characterize the, the coexistence landscape here is the degree of human influence. So that's on the X axis in this, uh, this particular plot. And it's, it's an index, so it's zero to 40. And it basically means that like a zero, actually I'll show it here. Yeah, so a zero is complete wilderness. Um, there's basically very little to no human influence on that landscape. And it scales all the way to a 40, which means there's, you're in the center of a city, there's highways, there's people. Um, it's like, you know, the center of any rural city in BC. So that is basically the, the scale that um, we'll use to, to partition this effect here. So the first take home was around mortality risk. So your chance of dying, um, both across a gradient of human influence and then broken out by sub adults and adults. So for both sub adults, it was more risky to um, live in human influenced areas. That's, that's no surprise there. Um, but interestingly, sub adults had a way higher uh, chance of dying. So we looked into why that might be. Uh, the first idea was maybe it's nocturnality. So going um, using more of the sorry using the same landscape but at night basically so on the x-axis is uh, the percent of the time that you're nocturnal 100 being um, you only come out at night and say 50 being you know you use half your time in the day and half your time at night so of course yeah as you become more nocturnal um, animals are safer and that that effect is more uh, accentuated as you get into higher human influence landscapes which also makes sense so then we tested were animals increasing their nocturnality as they age in these human influenced areas. So uh, if a bear was say three years old and living in a coexistence landscape, what was its um, nocturnality as a sub-adult? And then what was it as an adult? And you can see that uh, as you get into these riskier landscapes, the, the animals sort of change to more nocturnal habits as they're adults. So they're actively actually um, uh, changing their behavior to increase survival. But sort of similar to the, um, the previous paper, we looked at immigration required to sustain those populations when human influence is high. So even though they're going nocturnal and helping to bolster their survival, um, that wasn't really enough to sustain those animals. Populations would still decline um, without human influence, in, or sorry, without um, immigration in these higher human influenced areas. So this plot just basically says the amount of annual immigration required uh, depending on how human influence the area is. So yeah, these source sync dynamics and connectivity are really important to the number of animals we see on the landscape. So these adjacent wilderness areas are key. And it's a relatively sort of a, you know, it's a multi-dimensional type problem and insight. So we tried to highlight it basically with a series of plots here I'll show you. So this is kind of a, this is a 3D landscape of actually uh, Creston, just as an example. And, um, the, so darker blue is more human influence and then lighter yellow is less. And so no doubt that, you know, along the highway shown in red and in these cities are these kind of more human influenced areas. And then it's popped up in 3D just to accentuate that. And I'll basically show you um, what we expect that landscape to look like for grizzly bear population growth and immigration, depending on whether the animals were 50% nocturnal or 100% nocturnal. So this is basically if you use it half the day um, and then half the night, or if you don't use any of the day and you go fully nocturnal. So this is the population growth rate. Um, you can see that the animals that only are half nocturnal, uh, very, very low growth rates in the uh, human dominated corridors. So you can see that really drop down on the left side there. And then on the right, um, the animals that go, uh, if, if the situation was 100% nocturnal, really that, you know, that, that bolsters that population growth by quite a bit. So that's the contribution of that, that behavior to the whole population. Quite a large effect. Usually I have a pointer and I can point at it, but I hope it's making sense. And then similar is immigration. So you can see that under the 100% uh, nocturnal scenario, uh, way less immigration is needed to sustain those landscapes. So um, yeah, as animals go nocturnal, they're contributing to basically that uh, coexistence landscape and sustaining bears on the landscape and drawing fewer 
out of the wilderness. And this is basically just a projection of how many bears would die over a 10 year period. So um, under the 50% scenario, about 3% 3 3 of bears would live to 10 years old. So pretty 21% of bears would live to 10 years old um, in the other scenario. So yeah, a large effect of going nocturnal. And again, we're you know, always kind of hard on these model type projections. We always want to see it happening in, in real time. We want to be able to visualize it. And this is a female that I, I collared this fall. And so she was collared uh, near Hosmer, British Columbia in Southeast BC, right near Highway 3. She was kind of a, you know, a coexistence type bear. She also had two cubs with her. Those are shown on the right. And then you see a few of her relocations. So um, some of them are right in town, that's in the town of Hosmer, and then also right in Fernie. And interestingly, nobody ever reported this bear. Nobody saw her. She was never reported to the COs. And that's because every one of those locations that are actually near houses and near people were all at night. They're exclusively at night. This bear basically uh, would wake up. Uh, Cows are wandering around right in these downtown landscapes in neighborhoods, and they'd wander around all night. And then um, before daylight, she would basically take them up into the mountains and they would basically stay in one spot for most of the day. So I think this is kind of an example of what we're pulling out here that um, going nocturnal can really reduce conflict for these animals. So the take home is that um, immigrants from wilderness areas play a critical role in sustaining coexistence landscapes. Um, and grizzly bears are also active contributors to coexistence uh, through their nocturnal behavior. Uh, which increases their survival and it also reduces human wildlife conflict. So it's sort of this potential win-win for bears and people. So that's that's sort of the the high level um, science side that's sort of the uh, yeah the hundred foot thousand foot look at what we know about bears through my PhD thesis and then the part that I, I feel passion feel to be able to take part in is then what can we do with that information? How can we leverage it to actually uh, see some meaningful action for people and bears and other wildlife on the landscape? So this is kind of a, an evidence to action uh, part of the talk. And I'll just point you to these, uh, these superscripts here. Um, just like most collaborative conservation initiatives, um, there's always a big group of people and evidence that take it through. So I kind of tried to break out things by whether uh, it's a one, it was then sort of the primary outcome from our research, like our research drove the outcome, or a two is more of uh, our research was part of a, a few lines of evidence or a very large group that um, sort of did this. Just so we don't try to steal all the credit. So the first one's about huckleberry protection. So uh, in that ecological trap piece, I told you that huckleberry is a really important um, species for grizzly bears. And the flathead over for years really showed us that um, interannual variation in huckleberry is key for grizzly bear um, population growth rates and uh, female reproduction. And I guess in contrast to where it can be attractive to bears in the um, valley bottom be problematic, this huckleberry in the wilderness is, is great. It's an awesome um, resource for bears and key to their survival. So uh, Michael Proctor and I and a large group of folks started creating these um, these habitat maps of huckleberries. So we basically used grizzly bears to tell us where the huckleberries were. We went out and sampled about 700 uh, clusters of bears during August and September to find out where were the key huckleberries that they were zoning in on all across the Kootenays. And we made, made a map. So that's shown in the top left in the pink. And that basically highlights all of the, well, one local area just around uh, Fernie and Cranbrook, Sand Creek, where it predicts uh, key huckleberry habitat for grizzly bears and we have that for the whole so that nation um, was used to basically secure some huckleberry habitat for grizzly bears and the reason that there was some protection needed was that there was commercial harvesting of huckleberry happening across the Kootenai so basically people would come in um, and I understood that they had this sort of they called it a, a rake so it was um, like a box with teeth on it and they would basically just rake these plants and it would take all the berries off of it effectively but it also uh, would take lots of leaves and could potentially harm the plant. So there was concern that one having all these people commercially harvesting uh, huckleberries was keeping bears out of the key patches, but it also was potentially reducing the um, the caloric landscape for grizzly bears. Uh, 
So all of that together with some of the evidence that we were able to produce uh, resulted in a huckleberry harvesting restriction uh, to protect grizzly bear habitat across the Kootenai. So yeah, I think it was a good outcome from um, some modeling and some field work to protect bear, bear habitat. Mitigation, uh, this is kind of a gruesome picture, so sorry about that. But I think it also, I mean, it reflects the reality of what highway collisions mean for wildlife and also for, it doesn't quite reflect the reality for people, but there's also obviously a huge human side of this. There's uh, human fatalities, uh, uh, you know, human injury, and then a huge cost to all of that, fixing cars, um, healing people. So mitigating highways is sort of a new frontier for trying to um, find win-wins in ecology, where we can help animals safely cross highways and also get people and their families um, along the highway safer. So we uh, basically wrote an amendment over the last year and a half, a group of us, uh, Tracy Lee, Dr. Tony Clevenger, and then myself, um, trying to create a plan, a blueprint for how we could uh, basically mitigate all the collision and start in the elk case at, uh, with hopes that this sort of local focal effort could be scaled up at some point. So on the left, you just see a map of sort of the key linkage zones that we were able to identify, uh, partly using my grizzly bear data and then a lot of on the ground um, looking at the landscape and then roadkill data and Roadwatch BC citizen science data and things like that. So this was kind of the, the blueprint for that. And um, I think this initiative has been important because it sparked the start of uh, basically a connectivity project. And this is sort of one of what we hope to be many. This is a $6.3 million um, bridge upgrade just to the, to the west of Fernie. This is on Lizard Creek. And so the bridge is being replaced, but in the meantime, um, they, or while they're replacing that bridge, they put in an engineered wildlife underpass there. So it's uh, fully contoured with basically walkways on either side underneath the bridge for animals to cross underneath. So next steps here will be to, you know, fence it, that's less likely animals will safely go under as opposed to crossing, but with enough of these and with some fencing, I think that we can create some safe passages for people and for wildlife. The next piece is about roadkill disposal. So, um, and it very tightly ties into the previous piece about roadkill um, and highway collisions. So currently the, um, Basically, British Columbia has highways contractors, and their mandate is they have to pick up roadkill in certain time frames, and then they deposit it in a basically Ministry of Transport sanctioned dumping pits. And at least around here, they are basically open, flat gravel pits, and they're sort of left there. And the idea is that they're supposed to be um, uh, buried relatively fast, but what actually happens, at least in the Elk Valley, is grizzly bears get on them almost immediately and they eat them right there, or they drag these carcasses into the bush. And then the never actually ends up having to bury many because they're all usually gone. So this, this kind of information came from actually the collared bears that we would collar a handful of bears and we'd see them localizing on these certain locations. And I'll show you a quick video here. And those locations are shown in um, uh, <clears throat> as red triangles. You can see one on the top of the map there. And these are basically the hubs of these animals' lives. There's thousands and thousands of calories being uh, dropped here, and they're right near towns, near highways. So it kind of immediately popped up as a, a, a key attractant that we could maybe help reduce on the landscape to both um, reduce human wildlife conflict and to increase bear survival and human safety. So watch the video here. You see that one, it's like a, a hub, basically a, a spoke and a wheel. Um, uh, and use it quite heavily. It's, a, it's the center of their, their universe in the fall, bringing them right down to the valley bottom near people, near the highway and um, near a lot of conflict. And this is basically, you know, the, what it looks like on the ground. So here's a, a grizzly bear that is eating the remains of an elk. Lots of good food there when you think, you know, your other options are um, scrounging off the landscape and eating veg or something like that. Um, when you can get into a relatively um, consistently dropped food source like ungulate carcasses, it's, it's a huge win for those bears. 
So we worked with a pretty large group of folks, um, the Ministry of Transport, uh, the City of Ferniange, Coliza, um, Forest Lands Natural Resource and Rural Operations Development, sorry, Flynn Road, and um, uh, NCC. So how can we solve this? What can we do? Um, obviously, if we just stop roadkill in its tracks, that would probably be the best, but that's a relatively large project and we're not quite there yet. But as you see, we were working on it. So in the meantime, we basically created these bear bunkers. Um, well, all, all animal bunkers. They will basically keep grizzly bears out. Um, a number of wolves used those, uh, those dumping pits as well. And so these are, um, these are basically leftover concrete blocks that Ministry of Transport has that couldn't be used for anything else. And so we built one of them to, uh, to trial and they're all electric fenced along the top and there's electric gate on the front. And then the roadkill goes in there and is buried. So sort of a similar to what they had before, um, minus the bears and the large carnivores don't have access to it. So this is a first sort of pilot project. Uh, we're learning a lot from it. And you know, it's really been driven by uh, good partnership on this to do better um, for bears and people. And there's going to be a couple more rolled out uh, in the next couple of years in the Elk Valley. Uh, this was just the pilot, as I say. And, and the goal, obviously, in the end would be to um, completely reduce roadkill. But we're seeing it effective in the short term. So uh, we have a number of collared bears that have come and checked out these sites. And when they used to you know, linger and spend their whole life there, now they kind of walk by and they don't even stop with the collars. So the collars are on a, on a two hour fixed rate, so we don't see it that fine, but they're not there for hours. They probably try to get in and have a look and get shocked and then they move on. So I think at first, at first pass last fall that we had evidence that this was a, this was a success. So just to wrap up here, um, I think some of the take homes here are uh, the line between applied and conservation focused work and sort of the not as we once thought. Um, those two disciplines used to be thought as sort of separate and now I think that there's a lot of opportunity to do both. Um, I leveraged a large amount of data, a huge collaborative group that helped me do that across massive spatial extents to test theory and then that provided rigor and support to create uh, what we feel is uh, meaningful applied outcomes that benefit wildlife populations. So that's that. I want to thank um, uh, all of these groups, who, uh, without their support, we wouldn't have got any of this work off the ground. Um, so we got dozens of committed partners that help support this work. So yeah, I want to acknowledge their support and thank them here. And thank all of you for tuning in. That's great, Clayton. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, nocturnal behavior part of your um, presentation was interesting. And does moving um, into nocturnal behavior have de detrimental effect on bear health or reproductive rates? Yeah, I think that's awesome. And um, I think that's totally the next frontier uh, to ask. I get, obviously in the backcountry, they're not nocturnal for a reason. Um, there must be some sort of cost, one would assume. A good example is I think of, uh, so Michelle McClellan uh, on, the, on the west coast of BC did a study looking at grizzly bear use of huckleberry patches. So they basically asked, when were they out? Uh, were they limited by high heat? So in, in Lytton, they have you know, up to 40 degree temperatures on these really baked out slopes. And did they go nocturnal? So, and the outcome from that was these bears didn't use the huckleberries at all at night. And they were so basically focused on huckleberries that they would be up there in the middle of the day, even in 40 degrees Celsius heat. So I think there's probably a pretty key limitation that they're not able to eat foods like huckleberries at night. They're not, they don't have great vision. Um, they got tiny little eyes. So it could be that they're just not very efficient at eating uh, berries at night. So yeah, I think there could be costs for sure. Um, we're not quite there yet, but a great question. Okay, another one is, why is it desirable to eliminate carnivore feeding at these remote roadkill dumping sites? Wouldn't it provide a food source away from the more concentrated human interactions? Yeah, so I think the, the hang up there is that they're not remote at all. Um, they're right on the side of the highway. Um, 
and they're often uh, right near a town. So the one that we actually removed was within maybe 500 meters of Highway 3 and an actual rest stop that had picnic tables, uh, outhouses and things like that. And it was also the center of where everybody dropped their, uh, they launched their boats for fly fishing on the Elk River. So at any day, there'd be about 10 to 15 vehicles parked there guided uh, within maybe 40 meters of these carcasses. And the bears would just be basically sleeping in the bush. So um, had they been really remote, that might be an option. Uh, but generally, that's not, a, that's not really an option because then these, the highway contractors would have to drive way into these remote areas and drop them. And it would also just create probably a public safety risk than anywhere near these remote areas as well. So I think generally excluding them is probably the best that we can do at the moment. And then actually reducing roadkill is probably the best we can ever do. Okay. Um, and what would you say is the success of Bear Smart communities on the attractions um, when, within the ecological traps for grizzly bears? I think that Bear Smart's been great in, at least in the Elk Valley, and it, it's mostly focused on sort of outreach to, um, you know, to school groups. And I think that's, you know, obviously sort of going to the youth and trying to change these social means of interaction. I think is really important but of course we don't realize those benefits right away um as far as actually reducing attractions that's been relatively difficult in in the elk valley and in a lot of places and i think something that we want to get going here is a tree replacement program and it's kind of been trialed in banff and in canmore and i think there's a lot of folks that aren't necessarily that tied to their say crab apple tree in their front yard but they kind of like having a tree so if we had maybe a cost share program where we could replace their tree with a non-fruit bearing tree. I think that there's there's some good incentive to replace that tree and have a more sort of bear and wildlife friendly landscape that I think people of the Elk Valley and elsewhere would sign on to. Okay, um, and here's another question. Um, what is the time period um, within the Elk Fernie area where your data was collected? Uh, yeah, so my Mine was collected from basically 2016 onward for all the telemetry data, all the caller data. And then the, so the, the whole data, you know, at the provincial level was basically 1978 onward, started with Bruce McClellan's uh, thesis and is continuing to this day in the Flathead just south of here in the Elk Valley. Uh, I work on that project now, help Bruce catch bears. Um, and then all the genetic tagging data, like all the hair sampling basically started when that method was invented in BC by um, Bruce McClellan and Michael Proctor and folks. Um, that started in 1998 or so and has continued to this day across BC as well. Okay, uh, another person is interested in knowing, um, have you seen an increase in uh, the overall bear population after the banning of trophy hunting of grizzly bears? Yeah, I think it's a bit probably early to say. I don't think that we expect much of an increase. Um, most of the science suggests that the, the trophy hunt was not really a conservation concern for bears. Um, the harvest is relatively low and we've, we have always had pretty large and healthy bear populations across British Columbia. So I don't think we expect much of a change. Um, that was more of a sort of a, an ethical conundrum of whether trophy hunting of large carnivores was um, acceptable for the people of BC. and. I think the consensus was no, but it wasn't really, there wasn't really a conservation or a population um, concern for that. Okay, great. Um, are there other questions that anybody would like to pose to Clayton? We have a few more minutes here in our webinar. So far, it's been really interesting. So if you have a burning question, please put it in the Q&A box. And then Clayton, um, while we're waiting for any more questions, is there anything in terms of, uh, you know, additional information or something new on the horizon you're working on that you'd like to share with folks? Um, well, I, I always have a bunch of random stuff at the end of these slides. I could show you um, a cool so that was ever collared in, I think, the world, or at least North America, was by the, the Craighead brothers in Yellowstone um, in the sort of mid-1900s. And just, I think the video is a good, I, sort of highlights how far we've come in wildlife science since these early days, um, especially around drugs and all of these different issues. So I'll just show you this here. It's pretty interesting. I'm trying to take. I don't know. I'm trying to. 
So this is in Yellowstone, large, big male bear, but the drugs didn't work very well back then. And in, in contrast, like, you know, in the last 25 years where all the bears that we've ever done are, you know, done with vets and it, they're totally out, but the early days of wildlife science was a much different world. They're done in station wagons and the bears would sometimes wake up. And and also how hard it is to, to learn how to do these sort of things when you're when you're on the frontier and you maybe have a grizzly bear on your head. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Rocking station wagon. Yeah. Okay, we do have a few more questions. Um, so have you seen an increase in bear, oh sorry, I got that one. Um, similar to the first question, any idea what mortality decreased for nocturnal bears in the wilderness is? Yeah, so basically almost no effect. Like there's there's not much effect of a bear going nocturnal in the wilderness. Okay. Uh, could this, next one is, could this nocturnal behavior also be happening with other large species in populated areas, ungulates, for example? Yeah, I think for sure. Um, and I think there's evidence of that. Um, yeah, and I think the other, the, you know, the key question that the other, um, and you sort of, so obviously for the individuals, that's the best decision given the circumstances, but they must be trading something else. I think that's a pretty exciting research avenue to pursue next. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, another one. Uh, when grizzly bears um, in the ecosystem trap are, are killed, are they generally replaced from the wild one for one? Or how, how do bears determine, you know, this? They're, they're loosely one-to-one. -one. I mean, we've had bears in the Elk Valley for a long time. And I think if, you know, when I talked to Dr. Bruce McClellan, there's probably more than when he started working in the, in the East Kootenays in the, in the mid seventies or late seventies, there wasn't that many bears in the Elk Valley. So I think that that kind of changing social landscape has allowed um, some more bears to live here. And the population has been relatively stable for quite a long time. Um, we do go through like big declines and increases, it, it moves a lot, but the long-term viability of it seems to be relatively strong. So loosely kind of a one-to-one, -one. Um, but it's also not as if the bears in the backcountry sort of sense uh, an opening and then move. It's basically just every spring or um, summer, bears are dispersing out from their, from their moms and trying to find a home range. And they basically bump into the valley and find some good food and notice there's not many other bears around and set up shops. So that's kind of the dynamic. Great, okay, and um, let's see, here's another one. Um, hi, Clayton, we are currently designing a bridge with wildlife connectivity, which we hope will encourage grizzly bear passage. Any recommendations for minimum height and width, as well as vegetation requirements? Yeah, so um, I think the, certainly the biggest thing that you can do is make it sort of uh, as open as possible. Like, you know, these bears don't like crossing anything that's really narrow or confined or tight. So, um, you know, usually kind of the 30 to 50 meter width is uh, what we recommend. And yeah, sort of fanning it out once it crosses the highway to make sure that that entrance is really wide and welcoming. Um, and then veg wise, I, I actually don't know about that. So yeah, that could be something that I could uh, look into and um, follow up with you on. Okay. Here's another one. Um, ranchers used to be able to take dead livestock out into unpopulated areas to give carnivores the opportunity to eat them and help reduce the need to have them hunt. Now we're required to bury those. Is there any discussion about removing that ban so that we can make use of that meat, assuming that it hasn't been medicated? That I don't know. I mean, I think that um, the trouble is always where they're dropped. Like if they were dropped truly randomly in the wilderness, then I think, yeah, there's probably a little bit of food there to share with bears. But I think what usually happens is um, they kind of get dropped in, uh, you know, let's say populated areas, but on the side of forest service roads. And I think there's kind of maybe a, like a liability type issue there. Cause of course, if you drop a, you know, a calf or a full cow and then somebody's out there hunting or biking and they, bump into this thing um, and get mauled by this bear, which they would protect that carcass. I think there's sort of a, a liability concern there. Um, and there's some problems with uh, 
these large males dominating the carcasses. So, you know, a lot of the work in Alberta, they used to sling roadkill into the backcountry to basically, it was called diversionary feeding. They wanted to feed the bears um, in the spring so they didn't go down and cause trouble in the farms. And that wasn't really that effective. It was an expensive program. And what basically happened was one big large male would monopolize that carcass. And it wouldn't really provide that much of a diversion for most of the bears that were down in the bottom. So yeah, these things are really complicated. Um, and it's, it, at least never obviously think it's going to be. Okay, a um, couple more questions. Um, what are the bear denning opportunities for bears in coexistence landscapes? So they, they go up into the mountains, um, just like the normal bears. They, they are adjacent to, you know, a more risky type landscape, but they go up to, you know, bears den in generally north facing or north west facing steep slopes that will provide kind of consistent, um, uh, consistent snow for them. So they're really high. They're above sort of 6,000 feet. They're up in these bowls up in the mountains. And something that I don't think we know a lot about is sort of how different influences on the landscape can affect denning. So a good example is um, avalanche control. So bombing for ski resorts and highways, how that disrupts them, or similarly, say coal mining or road building when they're, um, they're doing explosives, how that might uh, kind of affect their quality of den and um, covering that. So unknown, we know where they go. We don't really know how being adjacent to those um, more human influence landscapes might affect them. Okay, um, and this person's asking, it's my understanding that grizzly bear populations were in decline in the Flathead Valley area, yet you've stated that the population is stable. Is that stability true for the provincial population or also true for the regional population units? Yeah, so the, in the Flathead, there was a minor decline, or well, there was a decline until about like 2007-ish, um, and then a uh, trend of an increase. Um, and in the Elk Valley, we had quite a large decline, like, you know, 20 to 40 percent of the bears declined um, during uh, basically 2006 to 2012 ish. But since that time, we've seen them rebound to almost uh, pre 2006 levels. And it's not as if the landscape of coexistence got way better during that time. It's just um, a bunch of bears and trying to, uh, you know, changing due to weather and things like that. Um, so I think the long term stability is probably there. Um, and at a big scale, I, I think in most populations regionally and provincially, we've seen bears increase over the last 30 to 40 years, not because the landscape has gotten better for them, but because in the 60s and 70s, we basically um, killed so many bears and they were, the populations were so depressed below what the landscape could sustain that as societal views changed, grizzly bears became actually a, a species of interest. They weren't a vermin anymore. Um, we've seen bear populations pretty steadily increase to that point. And I think now what we're seeing these sort of declines and moving around a more stable equilibrium probably signals that the bear population has rebounded. Now we're seeing kind of more natural fluctuations of a population that's not severely um, pushed below its carrying capacity. Yeah, great. Well, really good job um, fielding all those questions, Clayton. Really appreciate uh, your webinar today. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, you'll get a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to this uh, webinar video and also some of his uh, resources. And we have a post-webinar survey with just a few questions we'd appreciate uh, if you'd answer. It always gives us good feedback. And a reminder that our next webinar is uh, next week. March 12th. It's the last in our series with Corey Lawson from the Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada talking about bat boxes based on bat needs. And um, there will be a registration link to that webinar uh, in our follow-up email as well. So thanks again for attending and enjoy the rest of your day.